Today, I'll be reviewing these books. Oh, and, um, and these books. Well, January is finally over, and I've been busy reading. Mostly horror, of course. And so, with the new year, I wanted to try out a new feature here on this channel. I simply don't have the time to record a review video every time I read a book, so I'm thinking of doing monthly reading roundup videos in which I can discuss all of the books I read in the previous month. So that's what this is. We're going to go through all the books I read in January 2023, and I'll discuss and review them. Some in more detail than others, and I'll also be putting purchase links down in the What's It so you can find copies of any of these books for yourself if they look interesting to you. And I can tell you, there are at least a few that I can just about guarantee you're going to want to grab a copy of. While you're down there reading the What's It, you can also check out the links to my various other projects that keep me busy when I'm not here on YouTube talking to y'all. But with that out of the way, let's get right to the books. The first horror book I read this year isn't actually a novel, but a book about horror, and that's this coffee table book, Essential Horror Movies, Matinee Monsters to Cult Classics by Michael Mallory. There's a bit of a paradox in this book, I think. The people most interested in reading it are likely to be, much like myself, dyed-in-the-wool, old-school horror fans. That means that the people most likely to read this book are those who likely already know much of the information presented in the book. True horror fans will have seen at least most of the films discussed, although I suspect most people will discover at least one or two gems that had somehow flown under their radar previously. And the biggest fans probably even know a lot of the history. So, why do they want to read this book? The simple answer is that it's a beautifully laid out book full of photographs that remind us of some of our favorite films. We see the pictures along with the written descriptions throughout the book. I'm not going to show you too much for copyright reasons, but you get a sense of what sort of a book this is. And those pictures are combined with just enough text to trace the history of cinematic horror. Of course, we can quibble over the inclusion of one film over another, but in general, I do think the author's selections are mostly the correct ones to provide a taste of the multiple historic threads and subgenres that mark horror's evolution over the decades. And the history presented, though admittedly not terribly deep, is accurate and does a good job of showing the reader how scary movies have changed through the years. Younger readers, in particular, may be fascinated to see how their favorite filmmakers of recent years have stood on the shoulders of giants. It's worth honoring the triumphs of the past, and this book does a great job of it. One of the standout books for me this month was The Zombie Autopsies by Stephen C. Schlossman. The author is a psychiatrist by trade, and a very accomplished one, and used his extensive medical knowledge to create a novel of the medical research scientists might perform in the search for a cure for the zombie pathogen. I've read so many zombie books, and indeed seen so many zombie movies over the years, it takes a lot to surprise me. The zombie autopsies did. It's written in the format of laboratory notebooks recorded during autopsies performed on live zombies as part of a medical research program. And it tells a very simple story in terms of plot, but an extraordinarily deep story in terms of the thought that went into its medical detail. And that's the thing that's so remarkable about this book. Though I've read more zombie novels than anyone else I know, frankly, this one actually came arguably the closest of all of them to really scaring me, because the medical details the author, drawing from his own experience as a medical psychiatrist, the details that he presents in this story are just plausible enough to make the reader feel like 
something like this could maybe really happen. Most zombie stories rely either on a purely supernatural explanation of the dead rising from the grave, or they simply explain the cause of zombies as a virus. This book meticulously documents the mechanisms by which such a hypothetical virus coupled with a prion, which is a terrifying entity in and of itself, could cause many of the symptoms of zombieism. Along the way, we're treated to hints of remarkable ethical considerations related to the stage at which an infected person is considered no longer human and therefore subject to medical experimentation. And the book comes complete with appendices offering even further detail, including a fictional medical paper complete with a bibliography that ingeniously draws from both real and fictional sources, further adding to the overall believability of the narrative. This is definitely a thinking man's zombie novel. And, and that's true to the extent that those with absolutely no scientific background at all might struggle to understand it, and even if they can follow the plot, they likely won't appreciate some of the genius of the mechanism that Schlossmann has invented. But at the same time, you don't need to be a medical doctor to appreciate this book. Though I've read some medical books, and I certainly do have a scientific and biology background, I'm not a medical doctor. So that I was able to understand it demonstrates that you don't need medical training to follow this book. Most of the technical details are explained as a part of the narrative, but having that little bit of biological background, knowing some of the things that the author is talking about, I think made it even more frightening. Understanding what a prion is, for instance, makes it even more terrifying that a prion is combined with a virus, and that's what drives the zombie apocalypse in this book. But let's also not forget the elephant in the room. Though this book was written and published several years ago, the parallels, however exaggerated, of course, in the fictional setting in the novel, between government and public health responses to the zombie outbreak in the book and to all too real pathogen outbreaks in the real world can't be ignored, and an additional layer of terrifying realism comes from that sort of parallel between the fictional world and the world that we have lived through over the last couple of years. And of course the author never intended it, but it's a testament to the quality of his writing that the book still rings true after more than a decade and after some horrifying events have intervened. This is one of only a handful of zombie novels that I would place on my must-read list. And I guess this must have been something of a zombie month for me, because the next one on this monthly roundup is Can You Survive the Zombie Apocalypse? by Max Brawlier. This is a choose-your-own-adventure zombie story, and it's a lot of fun. If you remember reading those choose-your-own-adventure books as a kid and you ever wanted to try something similar as an adult, this book has you covered. It treats us to a fairly straightforward and almost cliched zombie story, but it's unique in that it presents multiple pathways and as many as 50 alternative endings. You can easily read through a single, complete story in a single sitting, but a lot of the fun is going back and restarting and trying these alternative choices to see how things might work out better or worse for you if you make different choices. There's not a whole lot of background information provided before you make the choices, so in a way the pressure is off. You never know which one is going to save your life and which one won't, so there's no puzzle to solve, there are no clues that you'll feel bad if you misinterpret, so you can just read them all the way through and enjoy the fun of trying out the different scenarios. The book suffers a bit in that a large number of the characters come across as somewhere between flat and unlikable, some of them even rather loathsome, and a lot of that is because each path through the book has to move so quickly in order to keep it to a reasonable size that there just isn't a whole lot of room for deep development. 
Don't expect anything approaching a great work of fine literature, therefore, but rather a fun novelty that you'll love playing with for a few days or however long it takes you to read through all the different variants of the story. And then there's Festival by Christopher Golden and Tim Lebon. This is a short little book that if you've been following this channel you might recognize from the January 2023 Nightworms package. It's, as I said, a thin little book, so I was able to get through this one pretty quickly. A single sitting, in fact. And I was excited to dive right into this one, because if you ever happen across a book by either Christopher Golden or Tim Lebin, you likely already know that you're probably in for a decent to great read. With both of their names on this book, it would be almost impossible for it not to be excellent. And indeed it is. We're treated to a very quick, single-sitting roller coaster of a read centered on some vengeful forces awakening during a music festival. I'll be the first to admit that while I am absolutely a fan of quality music, I am not a music festival kind of person. Most festivals don't feature the kind of music to which I'm drawn, which is actually fairly eclectic, but tends to the weird. I like weird rock music, some folk music, certainly classical music and opera. Anyway, my music choices tend to the weird. And I also tend to find crowds of people, as you might find at a music festival, to be uncomfortable. It would be very easy, therefore, for me to really struggle to relate to the characters in a book like this one. And yet, though I arguably have very little in common with the majority of the main characters, the authors present the story in such a way as to render the alien familiar and the familiar alien, and it makes for an excellent reading experience. If I were to offer a word of complaint, it would simply be that I think the book would have benefited from more pages in which to explore the characters and mythology more deeply. But even at that, while I may have preferred a full-length novel rather than a novella, the short length does add a certain something in that you can easily digest the entire story in a single sitting without any downtime. Illustrations by Peter Bergting throughout the book are not necessary to enjoy it, but do add a certain je ne sais quoi, and I think they contribute well to the whole. And then I read The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay, the story of a family vacationing at a cabin only to be told they must willingly sacrifice one of themselves in order to prevent the apocalypse. This was actually a rare reread for me. I tend not to revisit books once I've read them very often because there are just so many others I still want to get to. However, M. Night Shyamalan just adapted the novel as a film called Knock at the Cabin, so I wanted to reread it in preparation for a book versus movie comparison video, which will be forthcoming shortly. This, therefore, seems like a good time to remind you to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss my full discussion of this book. And while you're at it, do please share this and all of my videos far and wide. Leave a comment. In fact, leave a bunch of comments. I'd love to see an ongoing discussion of these books down in that comment section, so let us all know which ones you liked or disliked. I do realize it's annoying for myself or other YouTubers to constantly ask people to do all of those things, but it does seem like a necessity. By our powers combined, we can defeat YouTube's evil algorithm and ride on to eternal glory. Or at least I can pick up a few more subscribers. It's all good. But let's get back to Tremblay's book. Since I will be discussing the book in detail in that book versus movie video, I'll be brief here. A lot of people consider this to be Tremblay's best work. I don't quite agree, but I need to qualify that. I think it is his best work right up until the ending, but I felt like the ending was missing something. The first time I read it, I thought the ending was actually missing quite a lot. On a reread, I have to say I liked it more the second time around, although I still think that those last several pages just didn't quite hit the mark for me. 
not exactly horror, but at least about horror, I read Where Nightmares Come From. It's a collection of essays about writing horror compiled and edited by Joe Meinhardt and Eugene Johnson. Not all of you watching write horror, so I won't talk about it in too much detail, except just to say that it's a treasure trove of thoughts about the craft of writing from some of the biggest names in the genre. If you're a writer yourself, it's certainly something you'd want to consider reading. But of course, not everything I read is horror. Most of it is, but not quite all of it. This month, there's actually quite a substantial number of books that are sort of in that gray area between horror and non which I've been reading because I've been working on writing the Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society's case files into a book, or actually into a series of books, and I've been consulting quite a few references for those. In particular, I've been reading a lot about the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. That hotel is famous as a partial inspiration for Stephen King's The Shining and perhaps someday I'll make a video discussing the Stanley Hotel in a lot more detail because I do have a lot of great stories in those case files. But for this video, I've been reading a lot of both history and ghost stories about the hotel. Obviously, the history doesn't particularly fall into the horror category, but the ghost stories are at the very least horror adjacent, and because the hotel is reputed to be quite haunted, they seem worthy of discussing on this horror channel anyway. The first of those books is a book called Mr. Stanley of Estes Park, which is a biography of the hotel's founder, F.O. Stanley, written by James Pickering. Every once in a while you read about somebody who accomplished so much in life it kind of makes you wonder what the rest of us are even doing. Freeland Oscar, F.O. Stanley, was such a man. In his life, he had his hand in so many business ventures, invented so many products, and participated in so many projects, it's a true marvel of history. From photography to automobiles to a famous hotel, he certainly left his mark on history. James Pickering's book is the most complete biography I've yet found of Mr. Stanley, and provides a true wealth of information for anyone interested in his life and accomplishments. Indeed, the claim that Mr. Stanley almost single-handedly built the city of Estes Park, Colorado is barely an exaggeration, and this book provides a complete account of his activities both during his early life on the East Coast and his later years in the Colorado Mountains. Not only is it informative for those interested in history, either of Stanley himself, of photography, of automobiles, or of the supposedly haunted Stanley Hotel, but it's written in such a way that it's a true delight to read, filled with fascinating historic photographs and well enough documented that you could spend years digging even deeper if you wanted to. But the fact of the matter is, Pickering has so expertly extracted the key information from those sources that this book alone provides the complete story for just about anyone, except maybe an academic looking for primary sources. It may be thought of as a local interest book for those living in or near Estes Park, but the fact of the matter is, Stanley's life was so fascinating, I really think anyone would consider it a treat to read this biography. As for horror fans, this being a horror channel, you might be disappointed that none of the ghost stories are mentioned in the book, though personally I think that's a point in the book's favor. Those stories belong in other books. This may be horror adjacent because of the ghost stories at the hotel, but it's really about the man, not the ghosts. In addition to that book, I also read two short histories of the hotel itself. A History and Tour of the Stanley Hotel is by Susan S. Davis of the Stanley Museum, and though it's quite short, it walks you through not only a brief history, but also a sort of tour of the most important rooms in the hotel. And then there's A Concise History of the Stanley Hotel by Ron Lasky. It's pretty similar to the previous book, also fairly short, and covers a lot of the same material, but it mentions a few things Davis didn't, and vice versa, and this one also describes all of the owners of the hotel, from Mr. Stanley himself all the way through the present owners. 
Ron Lasky's wife, Celeste Lasky, wrote two books of ghost stories from the region. And you can see my little research notes still in these copies. So anyway, now we're getting into more direct horror territory with the ghost stories. At least sort of. These aren't particularly scary ghost stories, they're just collections of stories collected not only from the Stanley Hotel, but also from some of the other hotels and residences in the region. They also turned out to be pretty significant in my research, as all of the little sticky notes might attest, but that's for reasons that I'm not going to go into until the case files get published, because I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too soon. But Let's just say it's a really interesting story. Wrapping up the Stanley Ghost Stories is Stanley Ghost Stories by Susan Davis, the same person who wrote the earlier history book. This one goes room by room through the Stanley Hotel and gives us some of the stories guests and staff alike have reported in those rooms over the years. Again, not particularly scary as ghost stories go, though a couple of them are really good ghost stories anyway. And wrapping up the historical research about these haunted locations, at least for the month of January, we have the memoirs of Eleanor E. Hondius of the Elkhorn Lodge. The Elkhorn Lodge is an old guest ranch, also in Estes Park, Colorado, and it is also reputed to be haunted. Once again, there are no ghost stories in this book, but it is a good way to get acquainted with the history of the location, both the Elkhorn Lodge itself and the Estes Park region generally. Though not about haunted locations, another one I read as part of my research toward deepening my understanding of paranormal lore was Diary of an American Exorcist by Stephen J. Rossetti. With regard to this one, I enjoyed learning a bit more about Catholic doctrine surrounding diabolic warfare and the rite of exorcism, though I ultimately found the book a bit too conversational in tone and light on academic details to really expand my knowledge as much as I was hoping for. The book does a great job of raising issues I never even thought about in connection with the rite of exorcism, but then doesn't really follow up on those ideas, so my quest to understand exorcism will likely continue with more books in future months. And finally, we end with a book that really has nothing to do with the horror genre, and it's actually the book I'm currently reading. It's huge, so I didn't quite get to the finish line by the end of the month, I'm about halfway through it, but just in the interest of completion, the book is The Discovery of the Unconscious, The History and Evolution of Dynamic Psychiatry by Henri Ellenberger. For now, I'll just say that it's fascinating reading, and though it doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the horror genre, my own horror-obsessed mind has found plenty of parallels, particularly in some of the earlier chapters. But that is a conversation for a different day. For today, we're rapidly coming to the end of this video. I'm now just about 14 and a half books into my reading for the year, and hopefully I'll find the time to read even more next month, though I do keep myself so busy that whether I succeed remains to be seen. Regardless of how many books I am able to read, my charge to you is to go forth and read more horror. And of course, to take care and stay scared.